Welcome everyone. Today we delve into the fascinating narrative of the Iroquois and their formation of the Confederacy, exploring the intriguing links it may share with our contemporary lives and present day governance. Join us on this exciting journey to uncover the historical roots that may have shaped the way we are governed today. Centuries before the birth of the United States, the Iroquois Confederacy, also known as the Haudenosaunee, thrived in the northeastern part of North America. United by the great law of peace, a democratic constitution of their own, the Iroquois are likely to have served as a source of inspiration for the framers of the American Constitution. Unraveling the tapestry of Iroquois history requires weaving together threads of oral tradition, archeological findings, Jesuit missionary accounts, and the perspectives of European historians. Through this multifaceted lens, the story of the Haudenosaunee comes to life. In the heart of upstate New York, between the majestic Adirondack Mountains and the thunderous Niagara Falls, lies the ancestral homeland of a people whose story unfolds like the pages of an ancient manuscript, the Iroquois. The name Iroquois carries a unique origin, a tale woven with linguistic twists. The Algonquin, perceiving them as formidable adversaries, dubbed them Iroque, meaning rattlesnakes. The French, ever poetic in their insults, appended the Gallic suffix ois, giving birth to the name Iroquois. Yet the Iroquois call themselves by a name that reflects their communal spirit, Haudenosaunee, meaning people of the longhouse. It's a nod to their settled lifestyle and the significance of the communal dwelling in their culture. Beyond the Mississippi, where ancient rivers whispered tales of a people seeking refuge, the roots of the Iroquois journey were sown. Emerging from the Dakota stock, they embarked on a transformative odyssey that would shape the destiny of their tribes. Drawn to the fertile lands of the St. Lawrence Valley, the Iroquois settled near Montreal, Yet, the echoes of hostility from neighboring tribes compelled them to embark on a migratory path, seeking solace in the heart of New York. In the quiet ripples of Lake Ontario, their canoes glided, bearing the weight of a nascent confederacy. At the mouth of the Oswego River, their first settlement took root, a testament to their resilience against the currents of uncertainty. The formation of the Iroquois Confederacy was intricately tied to the migration and settlement of its constituent tribes, one group established itself at the head of the Canandaigua Lake, evolving into the Senecas. Another tribe took residence in the Onondaga Valley, giving rise to the Onondagas. The third tribe moved eastward and initially settled at Oneida near Utica, with the main faction later relocating to the Mohawk Valley and becoming the Mohawks. Those who remained formed the Oneidas. Additionally, a segment of the Onondagas or Senecas settled along the eastern shore of Cayuga Lake, evolving into the Cayugas. Before the Iroquois occupation, the region that would become New York was inhabited by Algonquin tribes. According to Iroquois traditions, they displaced these pre-existing inhabitants as they gradually expanded their settlements eastward to the Hudson River and westward to the Genesee River. Residing in villages surrounded by stockades, the Iroquois subsisted on fish, game, and limited horticulture. Their population, estimated to be around 20,000 souls, faced challenges due to precarious subsistence and constant warfare, a common plight among various Aboriginal tribes. Spirits populated the Iroquois cosmology, including the caretakers of sustenance, the spirits of the three sisters responsible for the growth of corn, beans, and squash. The Thunderer and the Great Spirit also held places of reverence in Iroquois spirituality. Before partaking in the gifts of the earth, the Iroquois expressed gratitude to the spirits through prayer. They recognized the interconnectedness of all living things, seeking permission from the spirits before taking from the land and utilizing every part of the animals they hunted. Dreams held a profound significance in Iroquois culture. They were seen as messages from the spiritual realm offering insights into desires and guiding individuals toward their fulfillment. The Society of Masks would enact these dreams, hoping to heal and make aspirations a reality. As stewards of the land, the Iroquois were skilled hunters, pursuing a variety of animals for sustenance and materials. 
deer in particular, held a special place in their lives, providing hides for clothing, antlers, and bones for tools, and nourishing meat for their tables. Yet, the rivers and lakes that crisscrossed their territories were also bountiful sources. Fishing, through netting and spearing, added a diverse array of options to their diet. Even in winter, when icy landscapes prevailed, holes were cut into the frozen waters for a fruitful catch. Living primarily in the northeastern United States and parts of Canada, the Iroquois were known for their strategic settlement choices. Nestled near lakes and hills, they crafted a life that, while not completely nomadic, respected the land's resources, moving every decade to ensure sustainability. Archaeological evidence traces the roots of the Haudenosaunee back to around 500 to 600 CE, with a distinctive culture emerging by 1000 CE. Descendants of Paleo-Indians post-Ice Age, their unique identity evolved over centuries, rich in tradition and history. Regardless of the knowledge of exact origins, the Iroquois became a force to be reckoned with, influencing not only the physical landscape, but also the political landscape of their time. Within the heart of the Haudenosaunee, the pulse of family life resonated through the intricate weave of the clan system, a social tapestry that defined roles, relationships, and the very essence of community. At the core of Haudenosaunee family structure stood the Longhouse, a dwelling that housed not just families, but entire lineages. Families began with a female ancestor, and the Longhouse family, led by the clan mother, traced its roots back to her. The matriarchal figure of the clan mother held a position of authority, guiding not only her daughters, but also her sisters and their descendants. In the Longhouse, families were more than just a unit. They were interconnected, creating a sense of security and support. Children, the heartbeat of the community, lived in the Longhouse surrounded by mothers, aunts, and cousins. The familial bond extended beyond biological ties, with cousins referred to as brothers and sisters, creating a rich network of relationships. Traditionally, women took charge of village concerns, managing property and crops, while men engaged in hunting, fishing, and trade. Elders, revered as wisdom keepers, played pivotal roles in imparting traditions and contributing to the upbringing of the younger generation. The iconic Iroquois Longhouse, a hub of community life, bore witness to the ebb and flow of familial bonds. Constructed with layers of elm bark and logs, it could accommodate up to 60 people, fostering an environment where shared traditions thrived. Within these longhouses, clans held sacred lineage records, and an animal guardian presided over each. Carved images of these guardians adorned doorways, and the same symbols graced cradle boards, each telling a story of shared ancestry. Women, the backbone of the longhouse, bore the responsibilities of housework, tending gardens, and preparing meals. Their etiquette extended to having food always ready for husbands, children, and guests, a gesture of courtesy that wove the fabric of everyday life. Iroquois women, revered as bearers of life and connected to the Earth's creative power, held sway over vital aspects of tribal life. With a profound understanding of sustenance, they decided the distribution of food among the tribe, nurturing both body and spirit. At the heart of each clan stood the revered figure of the clan mother. Endowed with responsibilities that transcended generations, she held the authority to name all within the clan and played a pivotal role in selecting the male candidate for chief. This choice, subject to the approval of the clan, reflected the delicate balance of leadership. The clan mother's duties extended beyond selection. She had the power to remove a chief who failed in his responsibilities. A guardian of tradition and governance, her role epitomized the delicate dance between authority and accountability. The Iroquois, initially shrouded in the vast New York forests, were first encountered in 1608. By around 1675, they reached their zenith, dominating a vast territory that encompassed significant parts of New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and sections of Canada north of Lake Ontario. At the time of their discovery, the Iroquois stood as the most advanced representatives of the red race north of New Mexico, showcasing intelligence and progress, although potentially surpassed by some Gulf tribes in certain aspects of daily life. Despite sharing a common culture and language, the five tribes of the Iroquois Confederacy experienced a historical period marked by frequent warfare among themselves. This internal strife left them susceptible to attacks from neighboring Algonquian tribes. 
referred to as the Dark Times in Iroquois oral tradition. This era reached its lowest point during the rule of a troubled Onondaga chief named Todadaho. According to legend, Todadaho was a psychotic chief with disturbing traits, including being a cannibal who consumed meals from bowls crafted from the skulls of his victims. Descriptions further portray him as possessing all-seeing knowledge, hair entangled with snakes, and the ability to cause harm with a gaze akin to Medusa. The events associated with Todadaho unfolded at a location known as Kanyenke, where figures like Hiawatha, Daganawida, and others worked tirelessly to establish a lasting peace that remains a living tradition in Iroquois culture. While some Western scholars place the formation of the Iroquois Confederacy at approximately 500 years ago, the Iroquois, along with many non-native scholars, date its creation to the year 1142, a period marked by a total solar eclipse in the region. This celestial occurrence holds significance in the Iroquois narrative of their confederacy's origin. Here's a distilled version of the Iroquois story of how the great law of peace came into being. Hiawatha found himself entwined in a tapestry of great discord, a time when fear gripped the night and violence, treachery, and sorcery lurked in the shadows. Hiawatha, along with others, valiantly sought to defy the wicked ways of Todadaho, only to be repeatedly ensnared by his cunning tricks. Haunted by personal tragedy, Hiawatha, who once had seven daughters, grappled with grief and sought answers in the solitude of the woods. In a hickory grove, amidst the clouds of his sorrow, he crafted three strings from a rush plant, weaving words not of vengeance, but of compassion and solace. Gathering shells for the wampum strings, he composed the words of condolence, destined to become the cornerstone of the great law of peace. Hiawatha soon encountered members of the Oneida Nation, who had heard of him and of the dream that he would one day meet the peacemaker. After sitting with them in council for seven days, Hiawatha traveled with their chief until he came to the Mohawks, where he would first encounter Daganawida, who was making plans to confront the warring nations of the Haudenosaunee. Born into a Huron village, the boy was called by the Creator and imbued with miraculous powers. The peacemaker then came upon Todadaho and convinced him to renounce cannibalism, entitling him in his new form as the first chief of Mohawks. The peacemaker then approached the Mohawks, unarmed, convincing them to be the first nation to adopt the great law of peace, which would come to include ceremonies and rituals to safeguard health, peace, righteousness, justice, and religion. When Hiawatha met with the peacemaker among the Mohawks, they shared their stories and, in some accounts, Hiawatha became a spokesman for the peacemaker. Hiawatha learned from Daganawida how to establish a union of nations and how virtuous and patient the men would need to be. The new chiefs would wear deer antlers to symbolize their positions. The delegation then sent word of their plans back to the four other nations. Each took one year to consider joining the great law of peace. After reporting back to the Mohawk Nation on their success, the delegation then formed a plan to confront the fearsome Todadaho, who had to be won over for peace to prevail. He was found living alone at Onondaga, bent and crooked in seven places. The peacemaker taught the Mohawk songs, including the Hymn of Peace, in preparation for the Oneida and Mohawk delegation to console and convert Todadaho. The peacemaker sang the song as he approached the sorcerer, rubbing his crooked body to judge his strength. As he finished, Todadaho's body straightened out and the snakes left his hair. Now, with his good and strong mind, the establishment of the great peace could begin. At Onondaga, the peacemaker uprooted the tallest white pine, the Tree of Peace, under which leaders buried their weapons of hate, jealousy, and war. This came to be known as burying the hatchet Todadaho became the Confederacy's central firekeeper, handing down the title to this day at Onondaga. Deganawida directed the people to not pass his name down as a hereditary title from the time of the formation of the Iroquois Confederacy. Today, he is known simply as the Peacemaker. In the sacred weave of wampum belts, the Iroquois forged a chain of unity, connecting the Mohawk, Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, and Onondaga nations. The Great Tree of Peace stood at its heart, a beacon of Onondaga wisdom.
Within the hallowed halls of the Grand Council, 50 sachems, or chiefs, convened to deliberate on the affairs of the Confederacy. The Mohawk and Seneca, the elder tribes, sat on one side, while the Cayuga and Oneida occupied the other. The Onondaga, the fire keepers, stood at the fulcrum. Amidst the Grand Council, the harmonious melody of the matrilineal society resonated. Clan mothers, the architects of destiny, selected chiefs to represent their tribes. Chiefs, stewards for life, bore the weight of leadership, guiding their people with wisdom and fortitude. Clan mothers, guardians of tradition, held sacred wampum belts passed down through generations. In their hands rested the power to shape the future, to mentor, and to set examples for the generations yet to come. To bind their destinies, the Haudenosaunee planted the Tree of Great Peace, a living testament to unity and endurance. The roots, extending north, east, south, and west, embodied the great white roots of peace and strength. Chosen to be the Confederacy's capital, the Onondaga, the Fire Keepers, opened and closed councils, shaping the path of deliberation. The Iroquois, fierce and unyielding, honed their warriors in a crucible of pain. Trained to be immune to suffering, these warriors became the vanguards of a people accustomed to constant conflict. Mourning war, a haunting practice born from grief and the thirst for retribution, a relentless cycle where warriors sought vengeance for fallen comrades in battles past. Captives, stripped and bound, walked a harrowing gauntlet, enduring blows from clubs, torches, and knives. A brutal passage through the tribe's grief-stricken ranks, a painful atonement for the losses suffered. The tribal council, arbiters of justice, assigned captives to families who had known loss. Some found a new home, while others faced a darker fate. Warriors, condemned to die, embarked on a torturous journey, a ritualized ceremony that tested the limits of human endurance. Their sacrifice, a solemn offering to the spirits. Yet, in the midst of this brutality, a paradox emerged. Some captives, especially women, children, and skilled individuals, found a semblance of belonging within their adoptive families. In the early 16th century, as the winds of exploration swept across the New World, the Iroquois people found themselves at the crossroads of a changing landscape. As European explorers ventured into the uncharted territories, the Iroquois, through raids on other tribes, discovered a trove of treasures, metal axes, knives, hoes, and kettles, replacing their traditional tools of stone, bone, shell, and wood. Woven cloth, a marvel from the distant lands, gradually replaced animal skins, reshaping the fabric of Iroquois daily life. The first encounter with the Europeans occurred in 1535, as Jacques Cartier sailed up the St. Lawrence River, leaving an indelible mark on the Iroquois consciousness. Over the ensuing decades, the French established themselves in Canada, while the Iroquois, ever resourceful, continued their quest for European trade goods through strategic raids. Fast forward to 1609, when Samuel de Champlain, a French trader and explorer, found himself embroiled in the complex tapestry of native alliances and rivalries. The Huron and Algonquin tribes, seeking French support, urged Champlain to join their war against the Iroquois, setting the stage for a pivotal moment in history. On July 29, 1609, Along the shores of Lake Champlain, Champlain and his small band faced off against the Iroquois in a skirmish that would resonate through the centuries. With a single shot from his long gun, Champlain showcased the power of firearms forever altering the dynamics of their encounters. This clash of cultures set the tone for centuries of French Iroquois hostility, with the Iroquois fervently seeking firearms to level the playing field in the evolving landscape of conflict. Once driven by prestige, revenge, or the acquisition of goods and captives, the Iroquois now fought for economic advantage, striving to control beaver hunting grounds and secure beaver skins for trade with the encroaching Europeans. 
Yet, with the arrival of Europeans came a silent menace. Diseases like smallpox, measles, and influenza, cruel adversaries against which the Iroquois had no defense, no immunity, and no cure. The 1690s witnessed a devastating toll on the Iroquois, losing between 1,600 to 2,000 people in conflicts with other tribes. Forced to confront this tragedy, the Iroquois turned to their age-old practice of adopting outsiders to replenish their ranks. In 1610, the Dutch established trading posts, breaking the Iroquois' dependence on the French and opening avenues for trade. Firearms, iron tools, and blankets exchanged for furs ushered in an era of large-scale hunting. The beaver, a valuable commodity, sparked the beaver wars, a campaign of conquest where the Iroquois clashed with neighboring tribes to expand their control and access more fur-bearing game animals. Between 1648 and 1680, the Iroquois, armed with European weaponry, drove out the Huron, Shawnee, Tionontati, Neutral Nation, Airy Tribe, Conestoga, and Susquehannock. Blood stained the soil, and survivors were incorporated into the Iroquois tribes. The conflict reached a temporary halt as the Iroquois lost their Dutch allies when the English took control of New York in 1664. During this tumultuous era, the Iroquois Confederacy etched a fearsome reputation among Europeans, skillfully playing the French against the British for maximum material rewards. In the vortex of these geopolitical struggles, the English crown, seeking Iroquois support against the French, exchanged goods worth 100 pounds in 1689. This alliance persisted through King William's War from 1689 to 1697 and Queen Anne's War from 1702 to 1713, leading to a pivotal meeting between Mohawk chiefs and Queen Anne herself in London. Queen Anne, impressed by her Iroquois visitors, commissioned portraits, believed to be the earliest surviving oil portraits of Aboriginal peoples taken from life. Meanwhile, the Iroquois Confederacy, at its peak in 1700, with a population of about 12,000, asserted dominance over vast territories spanning modern-day states and parts of Canada. The Peace of Montreal in 1701 marked a temporary cessation in conflicts, rendering the Iroquois mostly neutral. Yet, this neutrality didn't come without its costs, as the Iroquois received goods worth 800 pounds from the British, navigating the complex alliances with European powers. In 1714, the Tuscarora, defeated by colonists, joined the Iroquois, forming the Six Nations. However, full political equality was a gradual process, marked by years of probation. The relationship with the British grew in importance, with concerns over imminent war prompting a crucial conference to mend ties and restore the Covenant chain. As the French and Indian War erupted in 1754, the Iroquois aligned with the British, hoping for post-war favors. Yet the aftermath revealed unfulfilled promises and shattered hopes. The British, using Iroquois conquests as a claim to the Northwest Territory, strained relations. The stage was set for the American Revolution, during which the Iroquois Confederacy faced internal divisions a rift that foreshadowed future challenges. The Oneida and Tuscarora aligned with the Americans, while the Mohawk, Onondaga, Cayuga, and Seneca remained loyal to Britain. The ensuing campaign led by George Washington's forces aimed not just to overrun, but to destroy, marking a dark chapter in Iroquois history. In 1779, Colonel Daniel Broadhead and General John Sullivan's expeditions succeeded in crippling the British-Iroquois alliance. With the war's end in 1783, the Iroquois faced a harsh reality. The British, defeated, ceded Iroquois territory without tribal consultation. Forced relocations ensued, with most Iroquois moving to Canada, supported by the British. By 1800, the once mighty Iroquois had been reduced to a mere 4,000, ravaged by wars and diseases, marking the somber conclusion of a tumultuous era. As the American landscape transformed, the Iroquois faced challenges in adapting to changing circumstances. By 1797, most Iroquois in New York and Pennsylvania found themselves restricted to reservations. Hopes were high for assimilation into European ways of life, yet reservations grappled with social issues, contributing to economic hardships. 
the Iroquois displayed a willingness to adapt to a changing world, but resisted attempts to replace their cultural heritage with European norms. The clash of cultures was evident when Reverend David Brainerd proposed living among the Iroquois to help build a Christian church. Their response was clear. We are Indians and don't wish to be transformed into white men. In the late 18th century, a transformative figure emerged. Handsome Lake, a Seneca who called for giving up vices, influenced by Quaker missionaries. His Code of Handsome Lake advocated abstinence, traditional religious beliefs, and embracing farming and manufacturing for economic independence. As the United States expanded westward, the Iroquois found themselves entangled in the shifting tides of history. The War of 1812 saw divisions, with some Iroquois in Canada siding with the British and those in the U.S. supporting their nation. Yet many followers of Handsome Lake remained neutral. The aftermath brought further pressure to seed lands. The construction of the Erie Canal in New York ushered more Americans into Iroquois lands, and the forced relinquishment of territories continued. Some Iroquois moved west, forming communities in places like Wisconsin, Oklahoma, Quebec, and Ontario. By 1910, their population in the U.S. had rebounded to about 8,000, with even more residing in Canada. Today, the legacy endures. Approximately 28,000 Iroquois reside in the United States, with an additional 30,000 in Canada. Federally recognized nations persist in New York, Wisconsin, and Oklahoma, embodying a resilient spirit that navigates a complex history while embracing the cultural richness of the Iroquois heritage. The influence of the Iroquois Confederacy on the United States Constitution is a topic of historical debate. Some scholars and historians suggest that the Founding Fathers, when creating the U.S. Constitution in 1787, might have drawn inspiration from the political concepts and governance structure of the Iroquois' Great Law of Peace. The influence is recognized in a Senate resolution from September 16, 1987, which notes that the original framers of the Constitution, including figures like George Washington and Benjamin Franklin, admired the concepts, principles, and governmental practices of the Iroquois Confederacy. It acknowledges that the confederation of the original 13 colonies into one republic was explicitly modeled upon the Iroquois Confederacy, as were many democratic principles incorporated into the Constitution itself. However, it's important to note that the Iroquois Confederacy was not an exact model for the U.S. Constitution. While certain aspects influenced the framers, there were also significant differences. The influence of Native American governments, including the Iroquois, on the framing of the Constitution is recognized in the context of federalism and the idea of unification through mutual defense. It provided real-life examples of political concepts that the framers were interested in adopting in the U.S. The unity through diversity concept, exemplified by the Iroquois Confederacy's voluntary association of different tribes for strength, is considered a beautiful and distinctly American idea. The hope expressed is that Americans will continue to look back upon the example of the people of the Longhouse and allow their differences to unite them. As we reflect on the origins of the United States Constitution, let us acknowledge the profound influence of the Iroquois Confederacy a beacon of governance that lit the way for a new nation.